Hi, welcome. Uh, this is the What's Next OpenShift Roadmap update, but this is the developer edition. I've got a whole group of my PM friends on here to cover a lot of the developer topics. Um, so with that, we'll jump right into it. Just a reminder, so there's a series of presentations that happen with OpenShift um, Roadmap. There's the What's New, which talks about, hey, this was new in 4.9, and then the What's Next, what's coming in the next 6, 12 months. So this is going to focus on that sort of up to 12 months. So this is the look ahead. Things may change. Um, you know, there's a lot of changes, the market conditions, other things, priorities come up. So what you see here may or may not happen. Um, just standard PM disclaimer. Um, and this is the developer edition. So we're running these alongside the, the main OpenShift one. So let's dig into it a little bit. I just want to talk high level sort of the priorities within the developer tools area for 2022. One of the big pushes, and this is across Red Hat strategy overall, is around managed services. So really trying to figure out how we can take everything we've done with our open source components and really bring them together in a single managed environment that has a great experience for delivering those pieces. So you'll see things that don't necessarily bring in a like one-to-one, -one, here's an open source project or, or an offering to a managed version of it, but coming and wrapping those with an experience that kind of focuses on Red Hat's uh, application cloud strategy. So sort of sitting above and promoting OpenShift, if you will. Uh, onboarding, continue to drive on the Dev Sandbox, has been a great way for a lot of developers to get their hands on OpenShift and various uh, installed tools. Continue to work on it ways to improve the developer getting their hands on our, our tools, software platforms, and then being very productive with them earlier and as quickly as possible, removing a lot of friction. Also, uh, trying to continue to, like it's always been a goal is that platform adoption. So it's not about you know us winning at the best, I mean, we want to have with the great tools, but it's not a single tool kind of competitive in the market. Our tools are there to help drive the developer productivity with our with our platforms in runtime. So we'll continue to push on those items. So just a reminder, uh, we have a very broad um, portfolio of, of tools that we work on. This highlights some of them. Um, and some of them we complement with some basic tooling, all the way from code debug with um, code ready workspaces, VS Code plugins, IntelliJ. Eclipse extensions as well, um, command line tools, uh, developer console and OpenShift, ODO CLI tooling, build and package through the standard OpenShift build capabilities to wheels, which you'll hear a little bit about what's coming next with Shipwright, Helm, and operator enablement, all the way to enabling different technologies like serverless service mesh um, across the platform and uh, integrations with Sneak and and leveraging some of the other tools that exist for providing secure uh, software delivery across the platform. So there's a lot of a lot of tools we've covered here. As I mentioned, this, this slide doesn't cover everything. There's projects like uh, JQ service binding, um, developer sandbox. Um, we'll talk about this app studio code name. So a lot of things we'll, we'll cover that aren't part of this slide itself. With that, I'll turn it over to Devon. Hello. Hi, I'm Stéphane Lemaire. Uh, so DevFile, um, for those who uh, don't know DevFiles, they describe the best practices for end-to-end -end application development. And they are basically uh, uh, a codified definition of uh, a portable developer environment. So they help uh, our customers and the developers to move into this everything as code era uh with having a developer environment which are completely repeatable and reproducible we uh, are using the file uh, as a core foundation and enabler of the developer experience of most of the tools that we are providing for uh, for inner loop and we are continuing the expansion of uh, the adoption of the files by all the different tools being OpenShift open Developer Console, Audio, the different uh, IDEs that we are uh, supporting, and the uh, Dev Sandbox. We will be working on uh, adding the ability to define and configure the Dev File Registry at cluster level. So when uh, a tool will be uh, uh, 
connecting directly to a cluster, the dev file registry will be configured directly into the tools. We will provide uh, offline support for dev file registry. And in order to facilitate the onboarding and the setup of the toolings, um, we will be working on solution, allowing to analyze and uh, detect uh, the proper dev file for a project source code. Along with that, we will add the support for Docker file uh, build in the uh, inner loop uh, support of, uh, of the dev file. And uh, none of the less or uh, last but not least, um, dev files is uh, on its way to become a cloud native sandbox project as well. And we have uh, contributors and contributions coming from the uh, team from AWS and JetBrains as well. So great validation of our approach on this. Thanks. Moit. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Moit Suman. I'm the product manager for desktop ID tooling. And I'll be going through what we have next for 2022. So uh, we have different set of products, which uh, we have the ID extensions for, for both VS Code, IntelliJ, and Eclipse tooling. Uh, starting with the OpenShift extension, uh, the idea is to provide a seamless developer experience where the users can provision the dev sandbox clusters or support Podman or install their Helm charts directly from the ID. And this is going to be an ongoing efforts throughout the year. And we are trying to make sure users can provision all the clusters quickly from their ID and uh, start working on it. The second one is providing a support around serverless functions. So we have a K-native extension, both on the VS Code and the IntelliJ ID. And there will be a release which will be coming in a few weeks for the serverless functions. And that's going to be one of the important milestones for K-native development. The other one is having a developer experience around IntelliJ Kubernetes. We already have a Visual Studio Code Kubernetes extension supported by both Red Hat and Microsoft. And we are extensively working to have the same feature parity on the IntelliJ side of things, uh, so that users can do advanced cluster resource management stuff, view their logs directly, and see the local push of their application directly on the cluster using the Kubernetes extension. Uh, the next one is to have a support for Tekton, the same for both IDs, uh, basically having the support for extended pipeline history, showing the log retentions, and even supporting the latest Tekton hub on cluster for any custom tasks catalogs. So this will be an ongoing effect with what we are having with uh, Tekton CLI, and that will be replicated on the ID itself so that as a developer, the experience should be similar. The other one we are going to work for this year will be to have a remote container support where uh, users or customers can run their uh, VS Code extensions within a remote container inside the VS Code. And that remote container can be a Kubernetes instance or OpenShift or a Podman instance. And that will allow them to quickly provision all those scenarios within their containers. Uh, one of the important updates we have for Code Ready Studio, this has been a very successful product in the past. And we have, uh, based on the telemetry and user uh, feedbacks, we have decided to do end of life for Code Ready Studio. Uh, that's going to be on April 14th. Uh, there won't be any future releases for Code Ready Studio. Um, but the ongoing effort will be there on JBoss tools. So whatever plugins, the middleware plugins, uh, which are there on CodeD Studio will be supported with respect to JBoss tools. So from the customer point of view, they, uh, the experience will be there. Uh, they don't have to worry. The only update is it's going to be end of life for CodeD Studio. And as Steven mentioned, uh, the ongoing efforts for dev file support uh, will be there on the ID so that we have the consistent approach beat on ID experience or developer console. Um, that's it what I have for the ID tooling. So I'll pass it on to Kasturi. Thank you. You're a mute, Kasturi. Sorry. Sorry. Um, hi, my name is um, Kasturi. I'm the product manager for Code Ready Workspaces. Uh, on Code Ready Workspaces, uh, this year is going to be really action-packed for us as we embrace a lot of new things uh, that we're going to do. Um, 
in the first half, uh, or, or I should say, at the end of first half, um, we, we are coming up with a new name. Uh, but net net, the product score value proposition remains the same, uh, but it's just more to align with the branding, the developer tools is, is going to undergo. So our new name would be Red Hat OpenShift Dev Spaces. Uh, and we are also in the process of revamping our ar architectural design uh, with a switch to dev workspace. This switch has, uh, has already happened uh, in our upstream J and will happen in core ready workspaces probably um, end of first half. And uh, these changes are essentially driven to make things uh, more you know, lighter, flexible, and kind of um, also enhance uh, further in terms of scalability and high availability. So that's something for you to look forward to um, and embrace it as we kind of you know do the switch uh, along with the new name. And um, apart from that, um, there has been some feedback from the customers to make things simpler and easier. And to that end, uh, we're working um, constantly, not just with this release, but we've been doing that with a couple of releases uh, where we would simplify, um, constantly improve um, the uh, sim, uh, the install, you know, you know, making it much simpler as possible, and also, uh, you know, improving the startup times uh, of the workspaces. That's something we kind of um, all the time working to make it as quick and as easy as possible. Uh, we've heard from you, and uh, I think we are also seriously working on getting production-ready support for VS Code and JetBrains-based um, editors. Tectogon plugin, again, something that's available in the upstream, um, and we're looking to get that working on code ready workspaces on popular demand pretty soon. Uh, but these are very, very um, at a high level on what we're going to do, but there is much more for us to do. And if you want to kind of know um, every single line item that kind of sums up um, to what's on this slide, um, then there is a reference on the backup slide, which talks about the code ready workspaces um, future in terms of the in, in terms of the roadmap um, what I also like to bring um, is, is uh, to your notice is um, after the 2.15 release we kind of scheduled some time Feb and March installation of code ready workspaces as an iron service um, on OST will be deprecated as replacement customers can install code ready workspaces um, from operator hub instead uh, we're also dropping the support for uh, OCP versions 3.1, 4.6, and 4.7. Uh, that's something I want to bring to your notice. Um, thank you, and that's pretty much from me. Over to you, Stevan and Steve. Yeah. So on uh, our, sorry on uh, our container desktop tooling. Uh, initiative uh, we are going to start a new initiative on a, a developer container desktop tools and this tool is uh, is going to provide a, a ui for managing containers and leveraging uh, podman the goal is really to enable the developer to pull test run debug and inspect their containers on their uh, local dev environments but also to provide a, a bridge to Kubernetes and OpenShift. The target is really to help the developers who are working with contain, containers, but targeting to run them on uh, Kubernetes uh, or uh, OpenShift uh, uh, cluster. Um, and also into this, uh, we, we, we want to enable self-service consumption of uh, our managed services to the developers. So, uh, it's something new. We are uh, starting to kicking off this effort on uh, on this tooling. Uh, hope you will hear a little bit more in the in the next few months. Hey, sorry. Did you have anything else, Stephen? No, I'm I'm good on uh, this side. Okay. Thanks. Um, so with code ready containers, which fits into the space, um, was uh, has done a lot of great work to bring OpenShift a single instance onto the developer desktop and has done some recent work to enable Podman as well. Um, but what we're doing is um, we're discontinuing the code ready portfolio brand. And one of those changes with code ready containers is moving towards OpenShift local. And so a lot of the features you saw seen come in code ready containers will um, move into a OpenShift local or kind of uh, kind of blend into this uh, developer container desktop as well. And so one of the things we'll have to go through this rename um, and uh, one area that we'll see some growth, whether it will be, you know, 
area is how we align with uh, with other um, distributions of, of which if there's this project microshift, which is a smaller footprint that's being used for some of the pitch deployment. And we'll look at how we can leverage that probably in a uh, kind of a community um, supported kind of way first um, as a way to provide a slimmer Kubernetes API um, locally as for those that need it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Serena. Hi, I'm Serena Nichols. I'm going to be talking about uh, ODO right now. So ODO is our faster and straightforward CLI for developers to write, build, and um, deploy apps on both OpenShift and Kubernetes. But in 2022, we're going to be releasing V3, which will start at Dev Preview. The V3 release will focus on three major themes: um, onboarding with and onboarding with guiding guided experiences where we are going to be looking to provide more in-tool product getting started so that developers can get the context help needed to easily start with that technology area. Here you can see an example of what Odeo and it might look like. We're also going to be providing both inner loop and outer loop support where inner loop allows devs to work with the same IDE and local workflow that they're used to while deploying apps to open shift with a single command or even automatically. And we'll also, as I mentioned, we'll also be uh, including support for Outer Loop and V3. Our third major theme is around increased consistency between our developer tooling with Dev Console, ODO, and OpenShift Connector. Um, Stevan already mentioned that where the dev files are going to provide that consistent layer between our tooling. We'll also be working on consistent, uh, providing consistent ter terminology between the products, as well as guiding users to other tools in our portfolio as opportunities for awareness and learning. So for example, now that you've deployed this, go into OpenShift Dev Console um, Dev Perspective and monitor from the topology view. So these are some of the things that you'll be seeing in the next year. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing, you can go to odo.dev. I'll pass back over to Stevan for the next area. Thank you, Serena. So on uh, our developer services, we have service binding operator, which has been GA'd uh, back at the end of October uh, and is getting uh, some level of adoption and usage by our customer. Um, so we will be working on uh, continuing stabilizing the APIs and working uh, upstream on the service binding specification with the folks from, uh, from VMware. Um, uh, and we will also expand the number of compatible and compliant services. So this is a specification that all the services must uh, be conformed with the spec uh, so that they become enabled into uh, our tooling. We will also uh, look at uh, supporting uh, uh, servicing which will be provisioned through mcharts. Uh, that is uh, also a way we, uh, we observe the developers using quite a lot and oftenly to, to, to deploy their services. So we want to enable service binding uh, operator to work with those, uh, those services. And we will look at uh, the bridge experience that we can build between uh, secret management solution like Archicorp uh, Vault and service binding operator. So how could you inject secrets that are stored into, uh, into Vault directly back into, uh, into your application? Uh, so that's for service binding. Next slide. On Helm, um, so as Moit already mentioned, we uh, have an effort that is getting done on integrating Helm in the OpenShift uh, connector plugins. We are also working on uh, the multi-cluster support, and um, we, uh, we, we will be looking at uh, improving our approach on uh, the CLI and providing Elm CLI as an, uh, an OC plugin. So this will allow uh, to, have, to interact uh, with the same Helm engine, the one that is on the cluster. Um, and avoid the discrepancies between Helm versions that can be installed on the local environment of the developers and the one that is running on the, on the cluster. And another interesting thing that we will be looking at is um, the ability to export an existing application as a Helm chart. Because what we observed with uh, our customers is that most of the customers were 
creating and authoring M charts are starting from an existing application. They do an, uh, an export of uh, their Kubernetes resources, and then they clean, clean up all the YAMLs and templatizing them. So we want to see how we can help on that journey to help the developers to um, to leverage Helm in uh, in um, the goal of uh, better packaging their uh, their application for Kubernetes. Next slide. And uh, I think this one is back to Serena on web terminal yes. operator. Thanks, Devon. Yeah, so around the web terminal operator, currently we're still at dev preview, but um, just to mention that what this does is it provides a command line terminal feature inside of the OpenShift console. So this was released a, uh, a couple of releases ago, but we are gonna be coming GA very soon. Over the next year, we're gonna also investigate a number of enhancements for the web terminal, including supporting additional CLIs in the terminal, for example, um, FN uh, and PML, also being able to retain history within the terminal so that if your terminal times out or if you close it and reopen it within a single session, your history, history would be retained. We're also looking into supporting multiple tabs within the command line um, terminal. And last but not least, improved discoverability of the available CLIs. So this image shows an example of what this may look like. Now I'm going to pass over to Siama to cover what other group. Thanks, Serena. So uh, OpenShift Python and OpenShift GitOps are the, really at the center of our loop. And our mission is to enable GitOps workflows across a wide array of use cases uh, within Red Hat products. So initially, the, 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 the closer to mind when we talk about GitOps workflows, application delivery, infrastructure as code, and configuration management, which is what a lot of our customers start with. But our eye is really on that wider number of use cases that together with uh, ACM, uh, ACS, and, and also Ansible, we can enable across customers, cases like uh, configuration management and edge when the, the, the number of devices are large or fleet management through GitOps workflows, policy as code and compliance as code that is extremely top of mind for customers, MLOps and, and so on. And this is something that we keep in mind as we go throughout the year in, uh, in each quarter. Next slide, please. Specifically on OpenShift pipelines and OpenShift GitOps, what we are looking at is three main themes is, is go th through what we are focusing on right now. One is to make sure that GitOps is standardized as the workflow across uh, both pipelines and GitOps, not only for the type of workflows that customers have on top of it, but for managing and configuring these pieces of software uh, themselves. Secure software sub supply chain, that, that's an important uh, theme uh, for us and in many other products at Red Hat right now and improving the operational experience of running these customers, uh, running these products at customers when we have um, platform owners that want to provide them as a service. So that's another aspect that, that we will be, um, uh, that's a common theme that we will be focusing on. Uh, more specifically, when we look at OpenShift pipelines, pipeline as code or like enabling a GitOps workflow for managing CI itself, that's a huge area of focus for us. Uh, moving like hoping to to reach ga throughout this year and also some of the other aspects of dealing with ci like support for approval um workflows a manual approval in the middle of a pipeline concurrency control and and features as uh, similar to that it goes into the table state capabilities of, of pipelines around uh, security uh, provenance and signing and attestation is is an area of focus both apply to images produced through the CI, through a takedown pipeline, and also the pipeline itself um, and the task runs that that are that a pipeline is consists of when it executes. And the last bit is focusing on um, the operational bits uh, from uh, the takedown task ecosystem. Uh, one aspect is that we want to make sure that customers have a way to create a, a particular set of golden tasks that they allow their, their developers or SRE teams within, within the organization to use and be able to have that exposed within the platform and have that integrated with the rest of the ecosystem that we have, rest of tooling that we have, like Dev Console and CLI and so on. And also some of the other aspects of managing these, these um, uh, pipelines uh, on, on especially um, across a wide uh, number of teams uh, focusing on pipeline history and, and logs, for example, that right now 
we will lean a lot on, on OpenShift logging stack and uh, we want to bridge some of the gaps that exist there between pipelines and, and logging the stack, make it easier for uh, maintaining those logs or the, the details of pipeline that are executed in the past. On OpenShift GitOps, uh, we just heard from Stefan around the Helm. So we, we want to bring the experience of using Helm and GitOps workflow uh, to, to a much better level. Uh, there are uh, some of the aspects of working declaratively with Helm charts and Git repo that, that uh, we hear from customers being improvement. We will be looking at those. Bootstrapping Argo CD and GitOps workflows is something that we have uh, had available since last year in OpenShift GitOps. We want to put a lot more focus on it going forward. To, to get customers easily get a, get started with with a, a, a Git repo that contains a particular layout that they can push their applications to. Around security supply, secret secret management and integration with secret managers is um, is a huge ask. Uh, we will be focusing a lot more on that. We won't be supporting any secret manager uh, ourselves, but we, we want to make sure that customers easily can can use Argo CD with other secret managers and HashiCorp, which is the, the, the most widely used alongside the cloud providers, key managers. Uh, on the operational experience, uh, Argo CD multi-tenancy is something that a lot of our customers deal with because uh, most OpenShift customers out there are large multi-tenant clusters. And we want to bring that experience on par with OpenShift and Kubernetes multi-tenancy. Argo CD has, on top of Kubernetes, has its own multi-tenancy model that gives you two options. We want to make those two a lot more aligned and similar to the rest of the uh, software that customers manage on OpenShift. Um, also uh, provide a lot more guidance on, on managing cluster configuration through the GitOps workflows. Not everything in OpenShift or not everything about any software really is GitOps compatible. So customers look to us for guidance of how to do particular things that do not sit well within a GitOps workflow. And uh, we'll be providing a lot more of that kind of guidance throughout this year. Next slide, please. Handing over to Rob. Yeah, I'm Rob Gormley. I'm the uh, PM for OpenShift Builds. And a lot of our focus here is getting uh, builds to like Project Shipwright to Tech Preview and then through to GA. Um, what we're looking at there is trying to figure out the best way to kind of begin deprecating V1 towards the end of the year and making sure that we have, um, as you get through Tech Preview, um, all the things we need for that solid release there. Dev console support, build triggers, dependency caching performance, the things that kind of are required to turn this from a you know an early project to a full featured um, setup that just facilitates you know um, cube native builds and you know projects you right we're talking about things like you know sourced image, build packs, builder, etc. Uh, providing a path for um, migration from uh, builds v1 to builds v2 um, be that automated or you know guides and support for our users there and we're also looking at um, continuing our development and iteration on um, the various CI plugins one of the things that we're looking at there is uh, deprecating support or end life support for um, built-in Jenkins um, we found that that's you know very high maintenance and um, takes up a lot of developer cycles and moving that to a more um, native CPaaS um, integration is going to be the way forward for there. Also looking at, you know, focusing particularly on GitHub Actions uh, as um, the biggest um, client for CI plugins, uh, but making sure that uh, as we build out that and flesh it out further, we're also maintaining the ability to continue to support other um, CI providers Azure DevOps, Jenkins, and so forth. As you keep going through there, uh, let's see. Uh, enhancing pipelines, uh, CMAC alluded to a bunch of this stuff there uh, in terms of making sure that we have the tools necessary to, can, again, make sure everything is product ready. Um, image signing, log retention, uh, handling bundles, and the Dev DevSecOps integrations there. All right, I'm back to talk about uh, the OpenShift console and the developer experience inside of that. So in 2022, our main themes around the developer experience in the console focus around onboarding, platform adoption, as well as ad addressing requests for enhancements. We're focusing on a um, number of new features as well as improved experiences in many areas. So let me tell you about some of the things we're working on. In our import from Gitflow, 
um, or bring your own code flow, you'll see that we're now defaulting to secure routes. If that doesn't suit your needs, don't worry. Just hop over to user preferences where you can change the default settings to be, in, to be used in both import and, um, and import from Git and deploy image. Now note that that's gonna be released in early 2022. Uh, things that we're also looking at is when deploying Node.js apps, we are um, looking into enabling devs to, to enter optional parameters for the npm run command. Regarding Helm charts, we're going to be uh, looking into providing a quick start in the Helm catalog to show the users how they create a Helm chart repository, um, which is namespace scoped via YAML, uh, which will pull in additional Helm charts into that project. Following that, we'll provide a form-based experience to accomplish that same user flow. We're also looking into how we can enhance our service binding flows, which are unlocked by the service binding operator. Things like providing form-based service binding creation for increased discovery, as well as the ability for users to name their service bindings. Also looking into enhancing that operator back service catalog to provide discoverability of which services are compliant with service binding. Now let's dive into application portability. Once you've built your application in the Dev Console and tweak things to work exactly as you like, we're uh, working on a number of features which will allow you to move your application from your current project to another project or even to another cluster or even check it into your Git repo. As some of you know, we already do have the ability to export your application to YAML from the topology view. This feature is currently available with the GitOps Primer installed and you could even try it on the sandbox, Dev Sandbox today. But other mechanisms that we're investigating are exporting your application to a Helm chart, as Stevan mentioned, exporting your app and checking it into your Git repo, which would allow that next step to have it managed by GitOps. And we also have our migration team looking into um, a way to import an application from another cluster into the cluster you're currently logged into. Now, moving on to the theme of usability and desirability, let me share some of the items that we're investigating, including feature requests that we've heard from our users. Um, since many of the developers don't want to touch YAML, we're continuing to provide or looking into provide additional form-based flows for both creation and, uh, and editing. We're also moving, um, if we're thinking about the navigation and the developer perspective, we already provide the way for a user to add custom nav items there. But the feedback that we've heard is that users want to reorder those custom nav items. So we're looking into that. And regarding our topology view, we're always looking at ways to make that more efficient and usable, but we're also spending some time to address some scalability and performance concerns. These won't only be addressed by code changes, but also by some changes in the experience. So as you zoom in or zoom out, you may see automatically see more or less detail. Last but not least, uh, regarding des desirability, we're working, on, uh, we're working hard on providing a dark theme across all of OpenShift Console. Now, finally, let's deep, do a deep dive into portfolio enablement. Um, as you know, Developer Console is, uh, allows a number of features by itself, but as we um, install additional operators, we're really unlocking additional features. So with the serverless operator, with OpenShift serverless operator, we're looking into pulling in support for event syncs. We'll start with visualizing them in topology and then providing an event sync cut catalog for easy creation. Uh, we're also uh, going to look into the ability to have Kubernetes, Kubernetes services as syncable resources when, um, when working with uh, channels and brokers. And we are also providing a uh, event sync catalog as well as Kafka sync support. When looking at OpenShift pipelines, as Siamak discussed many of these uh, items previously, some of the workflows that he discussed, we'll be looking at supporting in the console in the future. So we already do have uh, some level of integration with Tekton Hub with a pipeline builder, but we're looking into supporting local Tekton Hub instances and being able to do that from inside the console. Also, in enhancing that um, pipelines as code experience and allowing for bootstrapping from the console as well as adding a Git repo. Uh, around builds v2, which is our enabled by uh, also called Shipwright that Rob discussed. We are talking about pulling those into the UI just to show that those resources are available. And then following that up with um, having builds v2 be that default build in, uh, in our import from Git flow. And finally, uh, we're working with the Cryostat team as they're looking to provide a dynamic plugin, which will allow developers a seamless experience from within the dev console to produce, analyze, and retrieve 
JDK, JDK flight recorded data from their Java, Java cloud workloads um, to help with some profiling. And with that, I think I'm going to pass back over to Parag. Thank, Thank you, you, Sabrina. So um, as I know many of you are familiar with the uh, developer sandbox where it had OpenShift. Um, so let's talk about you know the recap for last year. It was launched in 2021. So overall, uh, you know we have launched some new things in Q1. Uh, we did a um, you know are your data science fans have probably seen the Rhodes sandbox. Uh, so it enables um, you know to create data science models without having to provision OpenShift on your own. It comes bundled with the entire stack of uh, data science. Uh, we enable some uh, customer communication uh, like with some public Slack channels so that people can just talk to us directly, onboard a bunch of new operators, serverless, um, web terminal. We ran a hackathon uh, for uh, our managed Kafka service and the developer sandbox and OpenShift experience. And it was very well received in the APAC with about you know, 230 participants across nine countries. So you know, continuously delivering new things so that we can have more folks come in onto the sandbox to kind of try out our portfolio, try out the experience, and also use it to you know, kind of demo it or set up projects for customers uh, you know, if you're a reseller. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at you know the trials from an OpenShift perspective, um, Developer Sandbox is the highest um, you know, uh, system that is used to try out OpenShift. Um, and the good news is it also leads to the follow-up journey, which is, okay, after the Developer Sandbox, can we now go try out either a managed OpenShift or OpenShift, which is self-managed on public or private clouds. And then that leads to kind of sales opportunities and closure of uh, you know maybe even existing opportunities. And so we can see that developer sandbox is influencing uh, new trials of our platform and also influencing um, you know single year bookings for Red Hat. Next slide, please. So what's coming, um, you know, uh, in the next uh, few months is we're going to be, on, you know, adding more and more into the developer sandbox. We are, you know, onboarding the OpenShift pipelines operator. Uh, we are onboarding the database as a SaaS operator, um, especially with the launch of, uh, you know, the the Roda service uh, coming up pretty soon. Uh, we'll be merging the Rhodes sandbox now that we've had it out into one uh, Uber sandbox, which is going to be the current sandbox that we have, but now it's going to have a lot more in it. So now you can imagine the customers can not only create data science models, they can also create applications that consume those models and even run the pipelines to you know uh, run a few builds and sample uh, you know just sample tasks that they want to automate the end-to-end -end part of the what it takes to deliver a data science model into an application so very exciting um, you know it's going to be uh, you know a much broader uh, reach across uh, our red hat uh, customer base um, in continuing on the free to fee journey, uh, what we are, you know, as Serena mentioned about the, uh, the ability to export an application and then import into a cluster, we're going to be onboarding those capabilities into the sandbox and then tying it back into our console redhead.com so that you could actually, you know, come into the sandbox, create an application, export it, create a new cluster, let, let's say it's a Rosa cluster on AWS, and then kind of import the, um, you know, the application directly into there, so providing a, a, a free to fee journey there. Uh, to increase customer acquisitions, uh, we are going to be uh, working on a few things on the product side, most um, more on the marketing side. Uh, one of the things that we are targeting on the product side is having an activation code-based targeted subscription so that you could have a special event where you run. You can have a code that you can share with everybody. You could say, you know, code can support up to 250 new signups, uh, keep it valid for the next 24 hours, and then that way we can now find you know who came in for a particular event make sure they all come into the same uh, open, uh, developer sandbox environment uh, in terms of the cluster and then you can you know run promotions and the, and the subscribers can avoid having to do phone verifications and things like that they can just come in directly because you have shared an activation code so we're kind of working on that capability next slide please so App Studio, um, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's a code name, so please don't go by the you know by the uh, the title. But it is uh, targeting a managed developer experience that is going to be you know focused on uh, you know delivering a lot more of our app cloud strategy. Um, so you know, but this is the first step into it. So I'd like to share some details about it. Um, you know, with a brief overview. So, you know, we are working through the, you know, the flows that as a developer, when you're creating a new application, you have an existing application, there's a flow that takes to go from an application to a scaled out deployment of that application across a multi-cloud platform. Starts from wanting to create an application all the way to packaging, connecting it to services, and kind of portably continuously delivering it onto the cloud platform that is suitable for that application. Uh, next slide, please. And for that, as we all know, there's quite a few steps that developers have to go through. And some of these steps, you have to do them very often. And some of the steps are highly complex and may not have to be done as often, right? But it starts by 
how can I create a secure container, um, you know, from the source code that I have all the way down to how do I deploy it to all the cloud platforms? How can I access the data that I need to kind of fix issues when it comes up, when the application is running across the different cloud platforms? And so there's a lot of steps that need to happen. Um, and for developers, there's a lot of technology complexity and a lot of uh, the know-how that has to be kind of learned and built in before they can go from zero to 60 miles an hour. So currently the zero to 60 honestly just takes a long time. It is not the 5.9 seconds that you're used to in the, in, you know, in the public cloud world. Next slide, please. So what we are announcing App Studio at Red Hat Summit is it a hosted fully managed experience to solve some of these problems. You know, um, uh, basically enable developers to build full stack applications, including Java, Easily connect to all the leading cloud services and tools that are that they are used to, especially in the in the cloud world. Adopt certain DevSecOps practices without really becoming an expert in DevSecOps, and deploy to any cloud platform of choice. That's the mission that App Studio is, um, is working towards. And to make it easy, what we do is, you know, things like let's make it zero friction on packaging the software. We have secure runtime, so let's not let the developers kind of fumble around figuring out, you know, how do I create a, a container that is going to be secure. Provide seamless integrations. Uh, kind of hide the abs abstract out the technology and make it easy for them to do the work that they need to do without having to become an expert in the underlying pipeline products, GitOps products, the platform of OpenShift itself. Like we are just basically creating a developer experience which is managed by us. And then in the end, give them a single pane of glass for all your applications across the software de uh, you know, the development lifecycle and multi-cloud environments. And that is something which is very unique in, you know, currently in the industry. Like everybody has specific ones, but nobody has that kind of a layer where you could do all of this from one place and just run applications across a cloud platform that suits you. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, what we're going to do, we're going to target certain kind of applications which are you know suitable for App Studio, right? So full-blown front-end, back-end, all this stuff, but like distributed microservices, you know, applications that span across cloud platforms and geos, um, applications that are basically going to be scaled up with demand that comes in. Next slide, please. At a high level, when you look at the architecture of this, what this means is customers can bring in the services and the tools that they are used to that they want. And they could be tools and services given to them by Red Hat, by the cloud vendors themselves, by other even ISVs, um, like you know GitLab and HashiCorp and, and GitHub. Uh, and then you bring in the experience that is on console.redhat.com, and you can have a layer in the middle that ties this, makes it very easy to tie these applications uh, that you are creating with these services and the tools that you want to consume. Have a iterative environment, so you don't have to worry about creating a Kubernetes or an OpenShift environment just to kind of try out your application. It comes bundled with it. You just come in, you start running your application, iterate, iterate, iterate. You want, you can then commit to basically buying OpenShift environments when you're ready, right? And so it's not like you had to go buy one on day one just so you can iterate over the application. We'll give you that. It may take you months. It may take you days. It's up to the customer. And then once you're ready, when you deploy your applications, you know you can basically pick and choose the cloud platforms. You can pick and choose the OpenShift um, environment that you want on top of it. And then you know, we are working towards a hybrid uh, app cloud, the compute part of it, where we abstract out the, you know, all these things. And we basically are just, you know, customer can literally just pick and choose certain placement rules and requirements, and we just go deploy it irrespective of the, of the uh, underlying cluster. Next slide, please. So to get there, an you know, ambitious project, and uh, you know we're going to be doing it in a very measured way, iterative way. It's managed, it's hosted. So the good news is we don't have to follow product release cycles. We have wanted to make it really fast and iterative. Take customer feedback, bring it in, deliver the next capability at the end of every sprint. So we're going to start by launching a private preview around summit timelines, and we want to provide certain uh, capabilities in that. The key one being you should be able to create an app, iterate over it in the bundle sandbox create a Rosa cluster and just deploy it to Rosa. So now you have a multi-cluster, multi-cloud environment uh, experience right on day one of private preview. And then we go past it, right? Now we start bringing in the, some of the key managed services we want to connect in with, enabling some team level capabilities because you know that you're not going to be working on this alone. So we will start expanding it, introducing some paid tiers for cost recovery and also for SLAs, and just kind of give a very highly qualitative experience to the developers. And for Red Hat to find who know, uh, to kind of interact with these developers who are coming in from organizations and you know who want to really go into the cloud and are looking at how can we you know go cloud first but in a agnostic and a fast way and with as minimal effort as possible. So as you can tell, there's a pretty good roadmap ahead of it. A lot of it is going to be reacting to what customers want us to do, and yeah, it's a pretty exciting time. With that, I'll turn it over to Steve. 
Thanks, Brog. Um, yeah, we come to the end here. Um, some additional resources. Um, we've done the 4.9 uh, What's New Developer Edition, so we're looking at doing a 4.10 one uh, coming up. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, we'll update some links here as we have them, but if you do want to reach out, um, there's the DevTools PM mailing list, which is covers everyone on this call. Um, and yeah, thanks to uh, Kasturi Moet, Parag, Rob, Serena, Savan, and, uh, and Siamik for pulling this together. Um, and if you do want the gory details of all the different things that are happening, you can look in the backup of the slides and we have the uh, detailed roadmaps for all the different areas we covered that cover basically the quarters or more or less the rest of this year. Um, as I mentioned, um, continues to be a, uh, um, a, a growing uh, focus. Um, things may change, uh, things expand, uh, a lot of great stuff here. So please reach out if you have any questions. Um, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. And uh, thanks for listening and watching.